Thank you for joining us and welcome to Parker's Tech Webinar on Extreme Temperature Resistant Ceiling Technology. My name is Samantha Sexton and I'm the Marketing Communications Manager at Parker O-Ring and Engineered Sales Division. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few housekeeping items. All participants will be placed on mute during the presentation. Please take a minute to look at your audio to ensure you are muted or mute your phones if you dialed in. If you have a question during the presentation, please submit your question via the Q&A feature in your Zoom panel. Our speakers will answer your questions at the end. Should we run out of time for questions, we will be happy to follow up with you once the webinar has concluded. This webinar will be recorded for future replay. There will be a short survey at the end. Please take the time to fill this out so we can bring you future topics of interest. And now I'll hand the discussion over to our speakers to begin. Hello everyone, my name is Ricky Pickles. I will be speaking to you in a few moments about metal seals. I have been with Parker for 14 years now. The first half of my career with Parker, I was a design engineer for the CSS division, which um, creates and designs and manufactures the metal and metal and rubber seals and gaskets. The latter half of my career has been in pricing, marketing, and sales, and I'm currently a global account manager in the aerospace and military market. I will hand it over to Tyler. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Carnes, and um, I'm currently the business development uh, manager for the aerospace market for the O-Ring and Engineer Seals Division. I've been with Parker for um, almost uh, four and a half years now. Um, started out as an applications engineer also with the um, OES division. And um, I'm looking forward to um, telling you guys about the uh, technologies and, and the temperature ranges we've developed for our elastomer compounds. So jumping right in with that, yes, uh, I'll start off again with extreme temperature resistance sp specifically with the elastomers. Um, so when we look at our uh, offerings and what kind of the benchmarks have been for the industry, specifically with SKM and FSKM technologies, these gray boxes represent uh, where the technology has kind of been sitting both on the high temperature range and low temperature range for many years. And as we progress through this, um, you'll get to see the ways in which Parker O-Ring and Engineer Seals Division has been really pushing the limits on each of these metrics and trying to expand um, the temperature capabilities of our materials. So without further ado, I'm jumping right in. Um, what, the first thing we're going to start off with is how we're pushing it with high temp SKMs, specifically with our VA179 material. This is uh, a material that's been designed really for high temperature engine applications, any type of dry air high temperature. It has the opportunity to really bridge the gap between where SKMs have kind of uh, drop off after 400 degrees Fahrenheit and bridge that gap again between those and the FSKMs, which typically have about a 500, 525 Fahrenheit range. So this material, as you can see, is good in continuous temperatures up to about 440 degrees. We'll also show you some data later about how it is also good in uh, high temperature excursions, these type of short time frame um, temperature uh, exposures up to about 525 degrees Fahrenheit. Has similar uh, chemical resistances as a standard FKM in terms of diesel, biodiesel, and fuels. Um, and again, this is a material that we are able to make in an O-ring, a molded shape, and extruded as well. So as I mentioned, to get some of the specifics of the data, um, this is showing a couple of different materials, again, at the 400 degree Fahrenheit range. The blue and orange lines at the top represent really where the FKM technology has been in the past. It's V1164, VA156, kind of Parker's standard A-type fluorocarbons. The gray, maybe surprisingly, is actually our FF200, an FSKM material. This is a technology that's been around for quite a while. We'll discuss it a little bit later, but as you can see, at the 400 degree Fahrenheit range, even after 1,000 hours, the gold line, which is VA179, actually outperforms the FSKM really showing and demonstrating how well this material uh, has co compression set resistance um, at the same type of temperatures that we've been seeing for the fluorocarbon technology. Now, when we push the temperature up again to the 437 degrees, you can see, you know, the, the blue and orange line, the old FKM materials, 
still are almost at a complete 100% compression set. Um, we see, you know, the uh, the gray bar, the FF200, really starts to demonstrate um, its superior high temp capabilities. Again, this is a 600 degree Fahrenheit FFKM material, but that VA179 really is a, a step change better than the, the current FKM technologies and is really closer to that FFKM in terms of high temperature resistance. You know, again, this is a great graphical representation of how this technology sets itself apart from the standard FKMs we've seen in the past and really demonstrates its, its excellent high temp resistance. So that kind of covers our high temp for FKMs. In terms of FFKMs, as I mentioned, you know, we've had FF200 out for a while. It's our kind of um, benchmark 600 degree Fahrenheit FFKM material. It's been used a lot in the aerospace industry and, and engine applications. It's also FDA approved. We've seen it used um, in heavy duty engines as well um, and pharmaceutical. So it's kind of been um, a uh, foundational FFKM technology we've had for a while, again, about the 600 degree Fahrenheit range. So what we've seen in the marketplace, obviously, is that these temperatures are going to be pushed higher and higher. We want uh, better temperature resistance at higher temperatures, and we've seen, you know, 630 or even maybe higher kind of been the new standard for um, elastomers. And we're here to tell you that, you know, Parker does have a, what we'll call an extreme high temperature FFKM material. This is one that we state that can uh, seal continuously up to about 630 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has a lot of the same chemical resistances and other features as the FF200 we previously mentioned. It would be great in applications for hot engines, heavy duty, things of that nature where, you know, as the temperature ranges push further up, um, we need a material that exceeds that 600 degree Fahrenheit capability. To show you some data, um, comparing it directly with FF200, and we wanna point out the compression set data there, is that at every single benchmark, at 70 hours, 336 hours, at the various temperature ranges, the, uh, the 300, 630 degree FFKM, extreme high temp FKM, outperforms the current FF200. So um, where we're at with this material at the moment is that it's, it's not a fully commercialized, which is why I don't have a material name quite there for you yet, but if you have an application out there where you feel that there's an opportunity that um, we could utilize this material in a specific um, application, we'd be more than happy to discuss that with you and see if um, this could be a, the correct fit for what you have going on. So in terms of our high temperature resistances, we've kind of covered both FKM and FFKM. So moving over to the low temperature, specifically looking at FKM, FFKM, excuse me. You know, zero degrees Fahrenheit had been the benchmark for a while. These materials, one of the main drawbacks is that they do not have very good low temp resistances. So, of course, you, minus 40 has kind of been a standard low temp across several markets, really. It, it kind of represents um, the lowest temperature that we really see here on planet Earth. So there is a strong need in, in applications across the globe to have this minus 40 low temp resistance. And for a while, FFKMs did not have that option. However, some of you may know, uh, Parker FF400 um, is a material that was recently developed within the last five or six years that does meet a true minus 40 need. So going into it a little further, this is one that we um, utilize a lot in oil and gas applications, also in our chemical processing. Um, as you can kind of see when the attributes, it has uh, quite a myriad of various oil and gas um, RGD and sour service certifications, the ISO 23936-2, um, and then the TOTAL as well are just a, some examples of um, the specific industry certifications it has. And again, this is one that really pushes the boundaries um, for this low temp capability. Getting into some more of the data, um, while we see, you know, it does have that minus 40 capability with uh, the TG there at the bottom of a minus 31 Celsius, typically what we say in terms of um, actual application temperature related to the TG, it's about, if you look at it in Celsius, it's about eight or nine degrees below the TG is what we think it can um, service in actual application. And then if you're looking at it in Fahrenheit, it's about 15 degrees Fahrenheit below um, a TG uh, reading in Fahrenheit. So we have this low temp capability, but we don't really give up anything on the high side. 70 hours at 482 degrees Fahrenheit, still only about a 30% compression set. So it's a material we, we see a lot of use for down the road, especially as we continue to see low temp um, materials uh, coming to the forefront. Another one we have in a similar vein is our FF196. Uh, this is really the newest um, FFKM Parker OES has to offer. Um, really where this one comes into play is that 
uh, for almost every other material in FFKM, again, besides FF400, that zero degree Fahrenheit is pretty much the bottom of what it can handle. This 90 degree FFKM is different. Um, the T TR10, as you can see, minus 15 degrees Celsius, really what this translates to in actual application um, functionality is about a minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's closer to the low temp capabilities of a standard fluorocarbon that you might be familiar with, but it has the same high temp resistances, same chemical resistances. And additionally, we're working on the process of getting it approved to those same oil and gas, RGD and sour service resistances. As you can see, comparing it to the FF582, nothing really given up on compression set, maybe a slight increase as well in just the dry air heat resistance. Um, and one that we're looking to uh, continue to push in other applications and um, find uh, additional opportunities to, to utilize this new technology in. So finally, we come to our last slide, last block, um, the low temp FKM capabilities. Um, one of the materials we're most excited about pushes this um, need that we've seen to go down to minus 65. Really, this is driven from high altitude um, aerospace applications, other you know, space applications as well have seen temperatures push further and further. And for a while, FKMs were not able to meet that. Parker, however, a couple years back was the first company um, to develop a, a true minus 65 FKM technology with our VX065. So again, this is what we call our extreme low temp FKM. It still has incredible compression set, even though it has a, a great low temp as well. Same type of fuel resistance. Um, we see it used in aerospace, uh, with uh, turbine oil and applications and things like that, fuel as well. Um, so we really get all of the benefits of uh, compression set resistance, chemical resistance of a fluorocarbon while pushing that low temp down. So to tell a little bit more about the story, where we saw this is that a lot of times customers were having to make a choice between a fluorosilicone and a GLT FKM. So they would have to either say, well, if we need low temp, we'll put a fluorosilicone in the application, but we're really giving up a lot on the compression set. As you can see, um, 168 hours, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, almost a 70% compression set, which is non-ideal for that type of application. But the low temp was great. Or the customer would say, okay, we'll go with the GLT FKN. We get an increased compression set resistance, but minus 40 really didn't cut it for a lot of these applications. So Parker gives customers the option to no longer try and make that sacrifice and have to determine what the trade-off is. The compression set, only a 20% compression set at those same metrics, so the time and temperature, and a true minus 65 um, low temperature capability. So again, great compression set. And again, that TG, as you can see, is about minus 53 degrees Fahrenheit, um, pushing those boundaries. So we also conducted some high temperature compression set studies as well, just to see you know, how well can this material do at high temp? So not only does it outperform the floor silicone and the GLT FKM um, on low temp side, even in high temp compression set up to 70 hours at 572 Fahrenheit, only a 61% compression set, um, absolutely blowing away the rest of the material options. So not only do we think we have a material here that really pushes the boundaries of the low temp, it has excellent high temp capabilities as well. And then, it, you know, its sister compound, we, we certainly want to mention VX365. Really, the simplest way to think about this, this is the 90 durometer version of our VX065. Same low temp, same chemical resistances. Additionally, we've done some of those same uh, RGD and oil and gas certifications with the ISO 23936, um, sour service and RGD. So uh, another excellent material um, for low temperature oil and gas, high pressure applications. Um, that we, we want to utilize, again, this new development in low temperature FKM technologies. So to kind of summarize here, when we look at both low temp and high temp capabilities for FKMs and FFKMs, Parker OES has really pushed the boundaries in, in all of those metrics. And this slide just summarizes the different materials and the way we have um, worked to, to push and, and move this technology forward. So I'm going to throw it over to Ricky now, who will discuss the um, CSS Division Metal Seal product line. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Um, in instances where the O-ring division has reached their limit with the elastomers, we do have other options in our metal seals. These are for extremely high temperature and high pressure situations. So first, what is a metal seal? Metal seals are highly engineered sealing solutions that provide resiliency and spring back. So I wanna make it clear that Parker does not provide crush gaskets we provide resilient metal seals. Um, 
Some of these applications include fuel nozzles and engines, um, both land-based and flying engines, satellites, um, and extreme low or high pressure situations such as vacuums and downhole uh, equipment. How metal seals work, there is both elastic and plastic deformation. The elastic, elastic deformation is what provides the spring back or the seal against your mating flanges. The plastic deformation occurs during the initial compression of the metal seal, a small uh, immediate yield, and also in the form of the plating and coating conforming to your surface finish. So although we require uh, or request grooves to have a very good surface finish, a very smooth surface finish, there are still some small grooves in there that the uh, plate, plating and coating kind of molds to. So we do not require, we do not suggest that these seals be reused. Some terminology when you're speaking to our engineers. Uh, the free height is the cross-sectional height of an uncompressed seal. So if the seal is just sitting on your desk and you measure the free height, that is what uh, we, we refer to. The working height is the depth of your groove or the height of the seal once it's compressed into your application. And the seating load is the load required to compress the free height down to the working height. The spring back, again, is the difference between the working height and the free height after all the applied load has been released. So you compress your seal, you release your seal, how much did it bounce back? How much did it spring back? Uh, all of that spring back is not useful. Some of that is going to be plastic deformation or not create a good load against your flanges. So we do determine how much of that spring back is useful and our engineers can help uh, design the appropriate seal for you. And some standard metal seal profiles are C-seals, E-seals, spring energized C-seals, O-rings, U-seals, and axial C-seals. There are definitely more you can find in our catalog, but these are the most prevalent. Uh, so these are the ones I will go over to today with you. From left to right, this is just a graph showing uh, load versus leakage. On the left-hand side, you can see spring energized C-seals. They have a very high load but very low leakage. So you use these in critical situations uh, where you cannot afford to have any leakage uh, and you can afford to make sure that your joints are heavily bolted and sturdy. On the right hand side, you will have moderate leakage with your E-seals. Some of these are easy enough to compress with your fingers. Um, so you have a very low load, but these are gonna be used in joints that have a lot of vibration or perhaps thermal expansion and some gapping. So you're gonna have some moderate leakage. Jumping into spring energized C-rings. These have the lowest leak rate of all the metal seals out of our design catalog. These are used for pressure vessels, steam generators, exhaust joints. Uh, we do have standard cross sections and diameters that you can see in our catalog. Uh, there are also custom sizes that we are happy to help design for you. These are pressure sensitive, so when during the design stage, we need to know if these are internally pressurized or externally pressurized. Metal C-rings, again, they come in standard sizes, but can be custom. These do not have to be round. They can be oval or rectangular. These are used a lot in jet engines and fuel injection nozzles. They are used for cryogenics in extremely high temperatures and pressures up to 25,000 PSI. And again, this slide is just showing a cross-sectional view to reiterate that the pressure direction is extremely critical during the design stage. Metal O-rings come in industry standard sizes, the MS sizes for metal O-rings. Uh, these can also be found in the design catalog. These are very heavy joints with very little movement. So you're not gonna have um, any room for um, any gapping in your flanges. And these are typically used for nuclear storage casks where you have um, you know, very little leakage rates. These come in different configurations, non-vented, vented, pressure filled, or non-gas pressure filled. Uh, our engineers can certainly help decide which configuration is gonna be best for your application. Metal U-rings, this is where we get into a much more compliant seal ring. These loads are much lower and they come in standard cross sections. 
We also create custom cross sections for these and diameters can range up to 48 inches. These are great for joints where you get into turbochargers, you start seeing that thermal movement and the vibrations. So these can are kind of a, a good gap, a good bridge to gap between low leakage with some movement. You can kind of see a cross-sectional view of what the seal looks like. You can imagine how these seals are a little bit more compliant, um, but still provide a very good seal. Metal earrings. These are all hand rolled. Uh, these are going to be custom created for each application. Uh, diameters again go up to 48 inches and they are fully elastic. So these are going to be used in applications where you have some uh, gapping just due to assembly stack up or vibration or thermal movements between between the two flanges. And these come in all different types of configurations and convolutions. This is something that's going to be highly engineered between Parker and, uh, and yourselves. And again, just showing that the pressure direction is, is critical during design. This is a nice table just to give you an idea of how you should place your priorities and what seals you should be looking at. There's a lot of options. Um, so if you know what your priorities are, if your leak rate is your number one priority, then you need to go with a spring energized C-ring. The higher the asterisks, the um, higher, you know, that should be on your priority list. If you know your joint is a little bit weaker, you don't have any more room to place any more bolts, so you need to keep your load fairly low, then you know you need to kind of shift away from, oh, away from that metal O-ring. And these are some of the metal seal materials that we currently have available and use readily. Um, typically, we stick with Inco 718, Wasp Alloy, and Rene 41. Those are definitely our most common base seal materials, but you can see there's a large range we can um, design based on whatever your flange material is made out of and what's best for your situation. Some seal coatings. Most of these are done in-house. This way we can control the process, the lead times, and, and you know all that, that stuff. These are mostly dependent upon your base material, what the temperature is going to be in your application, and in some cases, chemical compatibility. Some of our engineering capabilities include 2D and 3D FEA. These are frequently done, so if this is something that your uh, design review is in need of, our engineers would be happy to provide these results for you. The lab capabilities include 30 and 100 ton test stands. We have environmental chambers. And we can also check with x-rays and FPIs for our welded joints um, to make sure everything is up to quality standards. Thank you for listening to Tyler and I. And we will now open it up for any questions you may have. At this time, we will begin taking questions. Uh, as a reminder, type your question in the Q&A feature of your Zoom panel. Should we run out of time for questions, we will be happy to follow up with you once the webinar is over. So for our first question, how does Parker determine the high temperature limit of a material? Yes, so our lab engineers, when we go about developing a material, will typically do um, testing to determine what that high temperature limit is. And specifically, uh, we really look at those compression set values. And so a lot of times when we do long-term testing specifically, we will do a thousand hour testing and determine at what temperature and, and test at various increments and determine at what temperature after 1000 hours of it's been exposed to a certain heat, does that compression set value um, exceed 80%. So typically um, in application sealing, uh, a general rule for the industry is that after 80% compression set, um, a seal no longer has any usable life. Um, so this uh, 1000 hour um, test to determine at what temperature um, it exceeds 80% compression set is what uh, the team, the development team uses to, to give these materials their high temperature limits. Okay, next question. What happens if the application conditions exceed the recommended high temperature limit? So typically, um, 
when a seal has experienced a, a temperature beyond what it is rated for, uh, for an extended period of time, um, a phenomenon in elastomer called a compression set takes place. And what this effectively does is the, the seal itself will begin to uh, take the shape of the groove it's been in, um, which basically means that it will no longer have uh, the required force um, to exert back onto the grooves to seal whatever um, fluid uh, that it has been sealing previously. And once that's taken place, you'll typically see um, fluid pass through, a leak will be detected, and um, upon inspection of the seal, you'll see that it has multiple edges are squared off um, or, or effectively take the shape of whatever groove the seal had been previously um, seated in. Okay, next question. Can metal seals be reused? Uh, no metals. This is a uh, North Korean speaking. Metal seals should not be reused. The metal seals adapt to the cavity, picking up the small imperfections of the cavity in the exact size of the cavity. And because they work to yield, it's a lot like a cork to yield bolt. It should only be used once. All right, next question. Should a metal seal be a slip fit to a cavity? No, a metal seal should not be a slip fit to a cavity. There should be space to allow for expansion due to pressure and temperature changes. Uh, always work with the divisions and designing your cavity to seal, because as your conditions change, you may need to adjust the cavity and the amount of clearance around the outside of the seal. All right, and in an effort to stay on schedule, it is 2.30, so we don't want to take up people's time, but we do have quite a few questions. So at this time, um, we'll stop. We will follow up with everyone that asked a question in the Q&A panel. Uh, feel free to reach out to us for any future questions. A recording of this webinar will be sent to you in the next week or two, as well as posted to our website at parker.com forward slash OES. We thank everyone for joining us today.